dear reader, allow me to introduce you to my book. Though it might at first appear like many books you've come across, it is far from ordinary. You may, therefore, have some misunderstandings about its nature. The story that awaits you has not been fully told. In fact, its conclusion is not yet known, even to myself. It is in that way that my book is special. It is in that way that you are special. Without you, there is no story. Chapter one, normal isn't what it used to be. This is a story about change. Nestled in a shallow valley is the town of Beacon Pine. Far from the town square, across the river, past the neglected welcome sign, a young boy walks alone at dawn. His name is Luca Van Horn, and like you, dear reader, he's here for a reason. Luca's closest friend. He possessed many fine qualities, but subtlety was not one of them. <laughs> Rolo finally noticed the tears welling in his friend's eyes and the flowers on the grave. <laughs> Wonderful! I had a good feeling about you from the moment you opened my book. That charm is a very special thing. Very special indeed. Keep hold of it for now. Its purpose will reveal itself soon enough. Rollo looked to the side suspiciously. Dear reader, forgive me for this interlude. Remember that charm you found in the dandelion patch? There are more of those special charms to discover throughout Beacon Pines. They've been known to reveal themselves to those who are willing. Some of them can be found in this very house. Since Gran had moved in, the house was more peaceful, more orderly, and more covered in flowery fabric. She kept a warm house, as if by grandmotherly obligation. An array of prepared meals crowded the refrigerator, each labeled with the day of the week. A pair of dull scissors, a broken can opener, a mostly empty bottle of glue, and some loose string. 
The only piece of furniture Gran had brought when she moved in was an old hutch. Oh my, this is quite exciting. I am now certain that you are the one I've been waiting for. You'll recall I was a bit coy regarding the use of charms earlier. Excuse me, I tend to have a flair for the dramatic. You are about to encounter your first turning point. There are certain times in this tale when everything hinges on a single word. Step forth, dear reader. Young Luca would spend hours hiding in the bushes, waiting for a chance to jump out and startle his mother. She always enjoyed humoring him by feigning terror. A beginner's guide to gardening laid open on the bench. <laughs> Luca stared at his feet and muttered under his breath. <laughs> right, of course. I forgot about the pajamas. Just some dusty knickknacks. Gran had commandeered the upstairs closet when she moved in. Some things need shelter from a young boy's mischief, she said. Luca paused at his parents' bedroom door. He just wasn't ready to go in yet. Gran's moving in meant that most of Luca's things had been crammed in the corner. Luca was somewhat annoyed by the situation. Gran's bed was undisturbed. Luca didn't mind that she had a habit of falling asleep in front of the fireplace. It meant that he could read late into the night. Luca tossed on his favorite old sweater. Even though it was the first day of summer, a chill still hung in the air. for the day. The best lies are built on truth. Easy. Impressive. You've managed to navigate your first turning point without too much of a mess. That is the power of charms. A single word can change everything. I think it's time to introduce you to The Chronicle is a record of the decisions you've made. You can see the turning point which has been revealed. 
At any time, you can use the Chronicle to go back and invoke different charms. Luckily for us, this is the one and only turning point where it's the perfect opportunity to experiment with rewriting things. We were just gonna go ponder for the day. This was Luca's chance to sell. Nailed it. Chapter 2 Welcome to Beacon Pines. For many years, this valley had been a small mining outpost. It wasn't until Sharper Valentine built his fertilizer company that Beacon Pines was established. Over the next 30 years, the town had grown and prospered until the foul harvest and his sudden death. In the six years since, everyone was simply trying to get by.
Rendezvous with Roxy. This is an important turning point. The first time where your charms will change the course of fate. And currently, we only have one suitable charm at our disposal. Have no fear, we can always return later using the Chronicle once we find more charms. Well, now I'm just rambling. Where were we? <laughs> as Roxy took a step toward him, cracking her knuckles. Luca knew he had one chance to save his friend from being dragged home. In the past, he found the best way to deal with an enraged Roxy was to be a little chill. Holden Wilder ran the local paper of record, the Beacon Beacon.
promise Gran regretted the second it was made. The Valentine Mansion loomed over every other building in town, both figuratively and literally. After the foul harvest destroyed their wealth and reputation, the Valentines shuttered off their estate from the rest of town. The path led into a small hollow at the edge of Weepwood. The fence thrummed with a gentle electric buzz. Luca often asked himself what Rolla would do, so that he could rule out that option. As sparks flew from the fence, the light atop that section shut off. Two bulbs remained. One more to go. The fence's buzzing gave way to silence. kid in town knew the old Valentine Fertilizer Building. Long abandoned, the warehouse once served as the industrial heart of Beacon Pines. Now, it stood only as a reminder of things left behind. The dormant building showed strange signs of life. There was only one way to find out. He heard faint sounds coming from the other side of the door. He pressed his ear against the cold metal to hear better. The sound of footsteps grew louder. The heavy steel door knocked Luca to the ground. Disoriented, he looked up to see an imposing figure silhouetted in a green glow. It lunged toward him. He tried to scramble away, but felt a gloved hand latch onto his ankle. Luca watched his fingernails leave trails in the dirt as the hand slowly dragged him back through the door, into the lab, into the green light. This is a story about change. It was far from the sort of change Luca imagined for himself. But change is, after all, a dangerous animal. The end? I probably should have warned you about this. There are many paths that our story can take. Most will end in tragedy. But don't let that discourage you. We will find the ending that this story deserves. I just know it. From here on out, a charm will have a check mark when it's been used to its full potential at a given turning point. Now, let's 
try something different. This is a story about change. It was far from the sort, but change the... I probably should. There are many paths. Most will end in tragedy. We will find the... From here on out, a charm will have a check mark when it's been used to its full potential at... Now, let's try... In the past, he found the best way to deal with an enraged Roxy was to be a little shit. As the glowing windows of the old warehouse came into view, Rollo began to bounce excitedly. under the weight of the bag. Rolo felt around at the large sack which burdened them. 
he snapped off a tag from just within a small zipper opening in the bag. Bo held the badge up to a faint shaft of light within the dumpster. Lucas sat in the dark, tracking the sound of Rollo's footsteps as he ran. One, two, three. He pressed his ear to the dumpster wall, straining to hear Rollo's footsteps as they faded away. Fifteen, sixteen, seventeen. He tried not to think about the contents of the dumpster as he counted. Thirty-five, thirty-six, thirty-seven. The thick stench made it hard to breathe. Screw it, that's long enough. Luca carefully lifted the lid and peered out. Nothing. No sign of Rollo. No sign of the man in the yellow suit. Time to haul ass. Luca clambered from the dumpster, stumbling to his knees. He was up like a shot and running, sprinting toward home as fast as he could. Beacon Pines flew by, blurred by the tears that welled up in his eyes. He wouldn't remember getting home at all that night. Throwing his front door open, storming up the stairs to his room and surrendering to sleep almost as abruptly as he hit his pillow. Chapter 3 Finding a Friend The next morning, it was quieter than usual at the breakfast table. Only the sound of silverware and chewing interrupted the awkward silence. <laughs> Gran's brow furrowed. She let out a long sigh. Her voice was quiet and even. An eerie electronic sound echoed from Luca's bedroom.
A pit formed in Luca's stomach. Luca's mouth felt dry. Luca could feel his heart beating in his throat. to Beacon Pines was a sort of natural barrier. volunteered at the library during the summers. He wasn't very social, so he'd dedicate each summer to becoming an expert in a single subject, making him a reliable source of very particular knowledge. If you were to ask Kato something he didn't know, he'd escape into the dusty old bookshelves and return with just the right thing. Kato was lost in his reading. Luca crooked his neck to see the title, Introduction to Melatology. He gestured to the shelves. Oh, 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 oh,
often, giving her little time to establish any real connections. She would tell you she prefers it that way. Luca shifted his feet uncomfortably. Beck pulled a coin from her pocket. chill as he approached Beck. Her eyes were locked on the strange green liquid. The nearby grass was coated in a fine layer of frost. broken tree branch into the goo. Beck's eyes widened as flowers grew from the dead wood. First small buds, which quickly bloomed into vibrant petals. As quickly as they had grown, the flowers began to shrivel and turn gray. Beck dropped the stick with a grunt of disgust. Iggy took a step towards Luca, his sneer lit by the glowing puddle. Beck could see tears welling in Luca's eyes, his fists clenched. Some things about Beacon Pines were very different from the city, but a bully from a hayseed town is really no different from a city bully. Beck took a deep breath and thought. Time to bust out the strange. Beck stared 
stared in silence, the only sign of life being the twitch of an eye. <laughs> of Iggy taunting back, something in Luca snapped. Iggy's smirk shifted to a look of shock as Luca launched himself into his stomach. Iggy's clothes were drenched in the glowing ooze. Iggy's voice began to slur as he struggled to get up. did to Iggy. Was Rolo caught up in all of this? Luca. Rolo, a wave of relief washed over Luca, which was quickly replaced by a sense of dread. Gran is going to kill me. If he hurried, he might just make it home before sundown. Chapter 4 Our Harvest Awaits. Luca took a deep breath and gingerly opened the door, stealing himself for Gran's wrath. Luca was alone. The house was empty. Luca was sitting by the pond, listening to small waves lap against a rock. His father sat in a folding chair in front of him. Without turning, he spoke. Why don't you grab me some nice bait? Sure thing, Dad. Luca hopped over to the tackle box and popped open the lid. Inside was a rolling, buzzing mass. We're fishing with bees? Luca's father gave a warm chuckle. Well, you catch more fish with bees than honey. Pick us out a good one. Luca closed his eyes and plucked out a bee. He could feel its wings struggle between his finger and thumb. Holding it at arm's length, he hurried over. His father deftly baited the hook and examined his work. Interesting choice. With a practiced flick of the wrist, the line buzzed in a graceful arc. The water accepted it without a splash or ripple. The wrong choice. But I respect it. The pond began to freeze. Up. Sometimes we gotta make the wrong choice before we can make it right. Pallid ice propagated across the still surface with an alarming speed. Luca scrambled back as the ground beneath him turned cold. Dad, I don't understand. Sorry, kiddo. Understanding isn't always part of the deal. The relentless ice shot through the fishing line toward his father. Dad, look out! 
his father casually wound the reel. None of it's your fault, you know. Never was. Dad, we have to go. Luca grabbed his father's shoulders, trying to pull him away. Please, you, you have to run! The ice crackled as it spread across his father's hands. That's the thing about fishing, Luca. His chest began to crystallize. You toss your hook in, and you never know what you're gonna pull out. A shock of searing cold ran up Luca's arms. He gave one last desperate tug. The chair tipped backwards in a single frozen mass. Luca tried to stop the momentum, but it was too late. He watched the icy form of his father slam into the hard ground, shattering into a thousand pieces that crowded around his feet. Dad, I don't understand. What does all this mean? The gentle rustle of leaves was the only reply. Luca's eyes struggled to focus on the walk. Faintly, he could hear Rollo amongst the noise. Rolo's voice was coming through more clear, but some words were still just static. The signal went silent. Luca held still, his pounding heartbeat marked. Lolo's voice began to fade. With that, the signal died for good. Luca grabbed the walkie-talkie and sprinted to the treehouse. heard a group of footsteps approaching. He dashed behind the bushes to avoid being spotted. <laughs> Mr. Tolliver paused, shifting his eyes to one side. <laughs> Mr. Tolliver took one long, quiet breath. shared a determined look.
Whenever Luca saw his dad's chair by the pond, it reminded him of the days they'd pack up a couple of sandwiches and fish until sundown. Luca opened the tackle box and picked the perfect bait. Luca gently baited a feather onto the hook, good for skimming the surface. Luca placed a sinker on the line. Sometimes the best stuff is at the bottom of the pond. Luca gently baited good for skin. Luca tied a shoe. What fish could resist a Luca tied a short fish.
could only see a cloaked shape behind the rocket. He strained to hear as a muffled voice began. Fear gripped Luca's throat. Luca stared at the ground for a moment, trying to place the dampened voice. The figure shifted slowly from behind the rocket, revealing itself to Luca. Luca reached over empathetically. Iggy's tone jolted to dejected anger. Luca slumped to the ground, overwhelmed by guilt.
Ricky slumped to his knees. Luca grabbed the walkie-talkie and headed for the window. Luca and Iggy climbed up the back of the treehouse to its roof, where Rolo had constructed his MCDC, the Mission Control Defense Cannon. crowd of clipboards, William Kerr strode forward, a warm smile on his face. Mission Control Defense Cannon around, aiming it confidently at the smirking face of William Kerr. Luca summoned his most insolent demeanor. Nonchalant wave of the hand, he made his exit. As the clipboards began to slowly advance on the treehouse, Luca looked to Iggy with resignation in his eyes. The end. That escalated quickly. Maybe discretion was the better part of valor here? Let's put a pin in this for now. Drew himself, he swung the mission control. Luca summoned his most insolent demeanor. Well, time to bust out the tickles. Lunged forward and began to tickle under Tisha's arms. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tears began to 
form in Tisha's eyes as she gasped for breath between gales of laughter. Beck redoubled her efforts until Tish finally had had enough. Iggy's eyes darted around, a realization dawning on his face that he was now outnumbered. before making his escape. Beck shook the ooze out of her hair as best as she could. Chapter The Best Policy. Luca paused for a moment, catching his breath. He'd only just met Beck, and somehow he already managed to drag her into this mess. Hopefully he could make it up to her. But finding Rolla was his primary concern. <laughs> Roxy and Fitz looked drained. It was clear they'd spent all day searching. <laughs> <laughs> Roxy's temper could often be dismissed as the impatience of an older sibling, but this was the most intense Luca had ever seen her. Her eyes were wild and unfocused, looking straight through Luca. In a torrent of rambled words and tears, Luca broke down. Roxy, still exhausted and angry, softened briefly as her eyes hunted the ground in thought. With a determined sigh, she looked up at Luca. <laughs> Roxy drew herself up. Roxy tried to think of the safest place. Luca wiped his cheeks and gave a quick nod. Looking into the puddle, Roxy rubbed her arms to warm up. Mr. Nuncree jumped with a start. Luca motioned to the phone booth.
Mr. Nuncree gently placed one of his substantial hands on Luca's shoulder. Luca peered up at Mr. Nuncreed. Kind eyes warmed a stern face. There was a deeper emotion hiding beneath it all. It was subtle, but Luca could sense something eating away at him. There was a shame lurking behind those eyes. A deep sadness. If Mr. Nuncreed was that worried about Rollo, maybe he could help. Mr. Nuncreed raised an eyebrow. Creed's shoulders slumped. A deep sigh bellowed. Luca attempted to take a step back, but Nuncreed's hand. With a firm shove, Nuncreed manhandled Luca into the phone booth. latched shut with a mechanical hiss. As Luca pounded the glass, the floor dropped from under his feet. The inside of the phone booth was now a loose capsule plummeting at gravity's whim. Luca winced and pressed his hands to the wall as he braced for impact. The capsule hurried to a surprisingly smooth stop. He felt a cold rush of air and opened his eyes with hesitance. Two large figures in hazmat suits occluded his view. Luca heard the deep, resigned voice of Mr. Nuncre. He knows too much. The end. Wait, no. This isn't the end. I know there's still much more. Somehow this went wrong. Okay, let's try something else. There was a shame lurking behind those eyes. deep sadness. If Mr. Nuncreed was that worried about Rollo, maybe he could help. Mr. Nuncreed raised an eyebrow. Creed's shoulders slumped. A deep sigh bellowed from his chest. Luca attempted. 
attempted to take a step back, but Nuncreed's hand clamped down on his shoulder. With a firm shove, Nuncreed manhandled Luca into the phone booth. The door latched shut with a mechanical hiss. pounded the glass, the floor, the inside of the phone booth was now a loose capsule, plummeting at gravity's whim. Luca winced and pressed his hands to the walls. As he braced for impact, the capsule hurried to a surprisingly smooth stop. He felt a cold rush of air and opened his eyes with hesitance. Two large figures in hazmat suits occluded his view. Luca heard the deep, resigned voice of Mr. Nuncreed over it. He knows too much. The end. Wait. No. This isn't the end. I know there's still much more. Somehow this went wrong. Okay, let's try something else. Nuncreed raised an eyebrow. 